Trig derivatives and trig derivatives. Let's start with sine. So all the rules I've showed you, shown you so far, do any of them really cover sine, cosine? Not really. We got polynomials taken care of. That's pretty much <coughs> it. Polynomials and rational functions are what we could take derivatives of before. So how do you take a derivative of a function that you don't know the rules for? Definition. So it's going to turn limit, h approaches 0. So it's sine x plus h minus sine x over h. So what is our algebraic goal before we can actually take our limit? Yeah, there's a bad h. So I'll write that in red. So that's the bad guy. So we're going to have to use algebra rules to somehow cancel that h. Easier said than done. What can we do? to that first sign term. So, so which identity do we need? It's the sum, uh, the sum rule for sign. So if you remember sine a plus b is sine a cos b or plus cos a sine b. So this is the sum rule for sine that we're using. And I'm going to do all my algebra together with the limit. And just keep rewriting lim, lim, lim. So this sum rule is sine x cos h plus cos, uh, cos x sine h. So that's just using the sum rule for sine. So I don't expect you to have the sum rule memorized, but you should at least be vaguely aware that it existed last quarter. What can I do now? There is some algebra we can do. I don't think we really need any more trig here. So if we combine the two terms with sine, in, sine x in them, we can factor that out. So let's go for that. And then we'll just sort of leave this term uh, separate. So this is going to be sine x times cos h plus no, minus 1. Is that right? That out. So we got cos h minus 1 plus cos x sine h. And I'm going to split, instead of writing a full fraction like that. Let's split this fraction in two. So we'll write it like this. So we're going to add up, add it as two separate fractions. Now we can take the limit separately as long as the two limits separately turn out to be nice. So as long as we can take those two limits separately, we're allowed to distribute. So let's see if we can take these limits separately. So now we have to pay attention to what variable is going to 0. Is x changing? looking at the terms that have not the h in them, but just the x in them. So are those two terms I circled going to be affected by that limb? So those are constant as far as the limit's concerned. So we're going to bring those terms outside or out front of the limit. So this is the constant multiple rule, even though it looks like a variable. But remember, the limit is concerned with the variable h, not variable x. So we're using the constant multiple rule. 
I'm going to bring those two terms past the limit. So we got sine x times lim h approaches 0. This limit on the right side is one that, a special limit that we saw before. What is that limit? So that limit's a 1. This is that sine x over x when x goes to 0, except it is sine h over h. So that's going to be 1. So <coughs> draw a little arrow, it just says goes to 1. And the next line, oops, we just get cos x. times 1 the other limit was special as well cos h minus 1 over h and that one will go to 0 so that was the other special limit that we saw before so this one's going to go to 0 so that's sine x times 0 which of course is 0 so this all reduces to cosine x. And both those limits were nice. They were both numbers. There's not some weird divided by zero problem. Those were nice limits that went, one of them went to one, one went to zero. So rewriting what we started with, that's ddx sine x equals cosine x. And that's our first can't finish. Oh, there we go. Finish the rectangle. So there's our first derivative. Derivative of sine is cosine. That may seem a little weird, and that's okay. We'll look at graphs and see how they're actually related. So let's get the derivative of cosine next. And we're going to need the sum rule for cosine, so I'll write the sum rule down. And I'll write it with a's and b's. I think we use lowercase a's. Anybody remember the cosine sum formula? Cosine a plus sine b minus cosine b plus sine a. So there is a minus. A cos goes cos cos sine sine, so it's cos a cos b is a good try minus sine a sine b so I'm going to give you two minutes to see if you can simplify this limit down I'll give you one minute head start and then I'll work this one out so same exact procedure as before you just use this sum rule for cosine not the sine sum rule and though there should be a similar factoring.
So I did a few steps in one. Did some applied algebra rule and a calculus splitting up the limit rule over a sum. And then factored and then the constant multiple rule at the same time. But I'm skipping steps mainly, well, one to save time, but also the steps are almost exactly the same as the ones that we did on the previous problem. And we see the exact same limits that we had last time. One of them goes to zero, the other one goes to one. negative sine x this time. <coughs> so I recommend you make that negative sign a little bit extra bold because you don't want to forget about it. There was not negative sign that, uh, and the derivative of sine is regular cosine and derivative of cosine is negative sine. And that's just something you have to memorize. Or something you could work out in two minutes if you have two extra minutes or three extra minutes. So next up, we'll go tangent. There is a sum formula for tangent. You can absolutely use it if you want to. However, we don't have to use that. So if I don't want to use the definition of derivative, I already know about the derivative of sine, derivative of cosine. So how can I use that information that I know to find the derivative of tangent? Sine over cosine. So red as sine over cosine. And then what rule are we going to apply first? Quotient. Quotient rule. So this is sine over cosine. and. See if you can write down the quotient rule without looking back at your notes. So right now apply quotient rule right here. And it should go a little bit faster than the uh, last time, than do applying the definitions of derivatives. And at the end, simplify. You'll get a bunch of sines and cosines. Simplify it to secants and tangents at the end, if you can. I'll give you about two minutes for this. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and graph sine and cosine. And you're going to look at them in probably a different way than you've looked at them before. So I want you to do this quotient rule. So we're going to look at the graph of sine and cosine first, and then we'll get back to that quotient rule. 
So <clears throat> in red, we got the graph of sine. And what I want you to do is think about what the heck is what I wanted. So look at the red graph and think about what I think I have the I believe it should be pretty close to being to scale the two axes, close enough at least. What does the slope of sine, the red function, look like at zero? Pick a number. It's got to be positive. It's going up to the right. One. So one. It looks pretty reasonable. Um, and if we look, what is the value of cosine at one? All right, so the, what's the value of cosine at zero is one. So the slope of the red function at zero is the value of the blue function. So let's look. It's a little weird where they intersect. Take a guess at the value of the slope of the red function. It's not quite one. It's a little tiny bit less, but pretty close to one. So what is the actual value? Whatever y value we get right here. So three quarters approximately, something like that. The next interesting point to look at, pi over 2, what's the slope of the red function? That's an easy one. Zero, it's flat. You're at the top of a hill. And what's the value of cosine? Zero. So cosine, the value of cosine is the slope of the sine function. <laughs> so a property you probably never noticed in pre-calculus class because pre you didn't think about slopes in this way. Now, unfortunately, we can't just switch the two functions to the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So I want to keep the colors the same. So I'm going to go and put cosine in for the red. And we'll go negative sine for the blue. And let's see, we'll go look at 0 again. The slope of the red function is 0, the value of the blue function. And we'll go negative 1, slope of the red function is negative 1. And that's the value of the blue function. So you can see the derivative of cosine is negative sine. And you can go pick any x value you want. It's a little hard to measure if it's a weird x value, but you just pick the easy ones that you know that you can tell pretty quickly what they are. So that is how cosine and sine are related with their derivatives. And now we'll get back to computing. So derivative of sine is cosine. So we have cos x times cos x minus sine x. The derivative of cos x is negative sine x over cos squared x. And we got negative sine times negative sine. That'll be positive sine squared. So this is cos squared x plus now we could uh, split the fraction up so this could be written as 1 plus sine squared over cos squared we could definitely split it up like that but there is a better there's another way to do it what can I simplify right away cos squared plus sine squared is 1 so that is 1 over cos squared. And of course, 1 over cosine is secant. So this is secant squared. <coughs> so that's derivative of tangent. How did I get to that step right there? So this is the co first cosine. This is the derivative of sine. So that's u prime. Okay. The quotient rule is right above it. So I lined it up just like the quotient rule. So this u prime v minus u v prime divided by v squared. So it does take an extra 10 seconds to write down the quotient rule before you actually use the quotient rule. But every time you write it down, 
it'll get a little more burned into your brain, which is a good thing. You don't want to mess up the quotient rule. It also gives you a really nice guide to follow along. I can check very easily that you know each part corresponds right here on the numerator, and then the denominator is v squared. So if you've done the quotient rule 100 times, 200 times, you may not need to do this. But if you're on your 20th or 30th application of the quotient rule, you may want to write it out like this. So that's true of tangent. We'll do secant next. And we'll do the same trick we did for tangent. We'll write it in sines of cosine. So secant is 1 over cos x. So you can use quotient rule here. So go ahead and apply the quotient rule. This quotient rule will be a little nicer because it's derivative of 1 is 0. So you get one less term, basically. So you should get the derivative of secant is secant tangent. And how did I break up that first fraction into a product of two fractions? I just thought about sine of x as 1 times sine x. And cos squared is cos times cos. So I broke it apart like that. All I did there was this rule. Multiplying fractions is relatively painless. It's adding, subtracting fractions that's generally more painful. So multiplying fractions, not a problem. So we got two trig functions left. We'll go cotangent. So how would you find derivative of cotangent? Well, it's the reciprocal. So it's cosine over sine, and then you do quotient rule, derivative. It's almost the exact same procedure. So I'm just going to write down what this is. This is negative cosecant squared. I recommend you go home and find the derivative, or go wherever you want to, and find the derivative of cotangent by hand. And also, I'm going to do the same thing for derivative of cosecant. Just write it out instead of compute it. This is negative cosecant cotangent. Well, you have to be careful. Remember, it's cosecant x. So x is the input for the function. So you can't, this cosecant of x, that's not multiplication. That's the input for the cosecant function. So I can't, this is not the same as x times cosecant of nothing. So you can't just flip it around like that. There's only one more problem we're going to do in this section. 
this section pretty much comes down to memorizing these six derivatives or taking an extra two minutes to compute the derivative you're going to need. I recommend you memorize them now. There'll be plenty of other things you have to do on your quiz or your midterm. So I want you to find the second derivative of cosecant. So I'll do the first derivative because I can just copy what's right above. So it's negative cosecant theta cotangent theta. Ooh, and that should be a dd theta, not a ddx. How do you take the derivative of negative cosecant times cotangent? I could write it in sines of cosines. But I think that would probably make things look more ugly. And I'll have to use quotient rule that in that case. What rule can I use right here? Product. Product rule. So you could bring your negative outside, or you could attach the negative to cosecant. Those are your two choices. So you can either leave the negative attached to cosecant, or you could, before you do any rules, any product rule, bring the negative is a negative one. So this is just constant multiple rule. So it's probably a little easier to find it like this, and then it's just negative. Negative one times that. So apply the product rule. And write down the product rule. Write down the product rule before you apply it. Any derivative or algebra questions? Now I could factor a cosecant out of this. That might be a good idea depending on what I'm trying to do. If I was setting it equal to zero, that would certainly be a good algebraic move to make. But there's no reason to change the algebraic form unless you have something else you're trying to do. So I recommend just simplify a tiny bit and then leave your answer. Uh, you don't have to do any fancy factoring afterwards. Unless you have extra time and you're trying to find something to do. So that's the derivative of, hopefully, the derivative of cotangent right there. So the next section we're going to do is called the chain rule. And that is how to take derivatives of functions of functions, or function composition. And it's a little bit more tricky than the other derivatives we've done so far. And it gets extra tricky when we combined chain rule with 
all the other rules together and know to know what derivative you're supposed to what is sort of the most outside operation so we'll talk about the chain rule and then do some uh, examples So chain rule has to do with function composition. So we'll start out with this function h of x. And h of x, this function, you could write it. So this is the composition. There is lots of ways to decompose this function, but the way I'm going to do it, there's this inside part, the inner part right there, and then you square that. So that's the two ways, the ways I'm going to break this down. So we'll go our inside function, or our outside function will be x squared. Our inside function will be that 3x squared plus 1. And now I'm going to feed the g function to f. And just like before, we're about to plug in something slightly, co slightly complicated into f. So if I take a box and f it, it is the box squared. So all I'm going to do is put g of x inside that box. So that's the input. And what does f do? Just takes the input, squares it. And that is that function h right there. So I just rewrote h as the composition of two other functions. So far, you do have a way to find this derivative. And remember, you can do algebra before or after you do calculus. So what algebra can I do first to change this form into one I can take a derivative of? The problem is there's that 2 out there, so I can't just go and take the derivative of that polynomial inside. What algebra can I do to change this form around so that 2 is not hanging around right there? What can we do? Foil. Yeah, foil it out. So actually multiply it by itself. <coughs> so f go ahead, foil this out, and then take the derivative. So there's our algebra first, calculus second derivative. So now we'll write out what the chain rule is. So if f is diffable at g of x and g is diffable at x, that's just saying that separately you can take derivatives of those two functions, of the f function and the g function. So if you have two nice functions, you can take derivatives, then there's 
a few ways to write function composition. You can write it out like fog. That's one way to write it. Another way is f of g of x. But if you write it like this, it's a little bit ambiguous when you put your prime outside. So to fix that, we'll just put an extra parentheses. So we mean take the derivative of that whole thing. And of course, you can always write it uh, with a d dx. So we take the derivative using the chain rule. What that is is the derivative of f of g of x multiplied by g prime of x. And I'll write down the most common mistake that I see. Looks like this. So it's f prime of regular g multiplied by g prime. It's not f prime of g prime of x. So this is the most common error. So let's. Yeah, they mean the same thing. <laughs> Just like there's multiple symbols to represent multiplication, like I use a dot here, which unfortunately also means dot product. Uh, but if you go way, way back, you would see things like 3x2, but it meant 3 times 2, even though you'd read that now and think that was 6x, not just 3 times 2, which is 6. So just notation changes. So there's two ways to write derivative. There's more than two ways, but two ways that we'll be writing it. All right, so let's go back here. We're going to apply the chain rule to this derivative now. So we have f and g. Let's find f prime and g prime now. So that should be individually very easy to find. These are just polynomials. Now I'm going to find the derivative of f of g of x. So I'm writing out the chain rule first. f prime of regular g of x times g prime of x. So what we have to do is feed f prime g of x. Yep. How are we supposed to get g of x? Yeah. Yeah. G, this one right here? Yeah, so we got original f and g, by the way, we decomposed our original uh, h of x. So I need to write down f prime of a box is two boxes, or two times the box. So we're just going to take g and put it inside the box. So f prime g of x is two times six no, 2 times 3x squared plus 1. So that is f prime of g of x. Just takes that g of x and multiplies it by 2. Now multiply by g prime of x, which is just 6x. So any questions about plugging those in before I distribute? So we had our, our f and our g, original f and g. You really only use the g of x in the, uh, over here on the right side. So multiply all this stuff together. We have 6 times 2 is 12 times 3, 36x cubed plus 2 times 6x plus 12x. So distributing and hopefully exactly the same thing right there. 
So here's another example where you can do algebra first and then calculus, or calculus first and then algebra. So if you write out f and g and then f prime, g prime, and all this, you should do this for a little while, maybe your first five problems or so. But I'm going to show you right now how to not actually write out f and g, and then f prime and g prime. So we're going to redo this problem without writing down all this intermediate, all these intermediate steps. So exact same problem. I'm just going to write out a lot less. So when you take these derivatives, what you want to do is think about what is the outside most operation. So are, are we squaring x? Is that the outermost operation? No, not even close. That's basically the inside operation. So the outermost operation is square that whole term. So I'm going to circle the outermost operation right there. So we know the power rule. So what does the power rule say? You bring that power down as a coefficient. So this is going to be 2 times. Now here's the trick. You basically copy over everything else. So it is 2 times the original 3x squared plus 1. And we drop that second power to a first power, which I don't. Well, I'm going to erase it. If you insist on writing first powers, you would want to make sure they don't look like a prime. So this would be a really bad notation to use. That doesn't look like a first power when you're doing calculus. So I recommend you avoid completely writing first powers because you might think it's a derivative that you'll take on the next step. So if you need to write a first power, write a full on, I don't know, what a capital one or whatever that's called. A one that looks nothing like a prime. You could write one if you really want to. So you know that it's not a prime. But you want to make sure you know it's not a prime right there. Now, we took care of that power. So we did as much calculus as we can do with that power. Now what we're going to do is forget about that power and work your way inside. So what's the derivative of the inside, 3x squared plus 1? That's just 6x. Yep. So we got times 6x. And that is a really, really fast way to do, I don't know if I can get both of these. Oh, we do have both of them on the board. That is exactly the step we got up there. We just did it a lot faster. Um, what if you had like a cube in here instead? So if that was a cube power or a third power, yeah. that would turn into a three and a two. So could you not know what you take it again? Or no, we, that would be the derivative right there. Uh, I, I mean, I might want to foil it out depending on what I was doing, but that written like that would be the derivative. We're going to do some more examples. Oh no, we have to wait till tomorrow. All right, so I'll be doing three examples in this section, and then we'll be out of the section into implicit differentiation. So I just want to warn you, the rest of chapter three goes relatively quickly. And we've already done linearization. And then related rates is the usually the hard, most difficult section in chapter 3.